A woman sits alone in the Mishima Dojo. The carving on the floor alludes to her romantic relationship with Heihachi Mishima. Her exceedingly antiquated and formal Japanese accent contrasts with Kazumi's youth. Beckoning the end of the Mishima saga, she discusses the fate of Heihachi and Kazuya with a prominent shadowy figure. Who could it be? Kazumi explains her mission to kill Heihachi for his sins, or probable sins, her only husband, and the father of her child. Obviously, she failed, but she readily admits that she'd die for the cause. In a flash forward, we hear Kazuya level the very same accusation to the old man. It's a face-off out of Volcano. Typical Mishima affair. This cuts nicely into Tekken 7's arcade opening. It's so strong! Heat Haze Shadow is an absolute banger, and the fight choreography is capturing, using it to mirror the two's private feud. The neon reds of the lava glowing establish the burning hatred between them. At one point, it even gives diegetic hit sparks to a twin roundhouse. While the scene at first reveals their matching strength, the balance of power begins to tip in Kazi's favor, allowing him to chisel Hay's cheekbones for a second. But just like Tekken 2, Heihachi comes back for some payback revenge. The scene fades to black and reiterates what we've established. Back to that first 2014 trailer, Kazumi in her ignorance asks what Heihachi might do to Kazuya, or to the world, and we're shown scenes of the world suffering at the hands of uh, Kazuya and Jin. What's promised here is that the history of this family dispute is going to be given new depth before it's quenched once and for all. It's a massive promise to us, but the warning is already here. The devil is no longer going to be used as a thematic tool to tell the tale of power for power's sake, but as a narrative tool to show Kazuya's deeper emotional connection to his mother and how he still carries her with him, because Kazumi herself passed on the devil gene to Kazuya. This is the penultimate cutscene of the game. This is amazing. I mean, they're changing a few details here and there, but it's still really cool. How could they possibly fuck this up? To catch us up to speed, we need to recap the plot so far. To do this, we have a playable section of the legendary Kazuya drop. The lad hurls the accusation Heihachi killed his mummy, and Heihachi stands there, taking everything Kazuya throws at him like a bad dream. Some moves that would give Kazuya too much pushback aren't available, like Wave Dash 3, and this is in order to guarantee Heihachi's punches back. They tested to make sure this scene would go as perfectly as possible since it's one of the most important scenes in the history of Tekken. Furthermore, it's a great way for absolutely new players to get used to the appendage-based button layout, or the assist button. The boy is alone and helpless, and Heihachi eventually knocks the child out, dropping him and cementing history. Already we're seeing hints that maybe there was something more to Heihachi dropping Kazuya off the cliff, something that maybe betrays the series' core theme, but with actual individual purpose for Hei. The other part of this recap is that we're going to reuse cutscenes from Tekken 6 while Nina tells us the basic plot and ending of that game. Why does it have to be Nina? Why can't it be Lars or Raven? There's like five people who know what really went on, and you pick Nina. Do we really need this recap? All we need to know is that the war between Kazuya's G Corp and Jin's Mishima Zaibatsu has torn the world apart, and now Jin is missing in action having failed his goal. And his abdication of the throne opens the door for a certain dashing, mustached rogue to claim what's rightfully his. And that's actually just what Heihachi does to the absolute god. He's walking through these pissant guards, storming the castle in stride like it's nothing. He blocks bullets with doors he can kick through, and deflects missiles like it's just another day at the office. I guess that it kind of is. The events between Tekken 4 and 7 have happened at the very least within the same month. The throne's a bit of a musical chair at this point. And of that music, thankfully, the game delivers one of its few victories in the form of the Mishima building, recreating the Nancy Elevator from Tekken 6. Between the electronic verses, there's a nice orchestral chorus that sounds triumphant and deeply imbued in the art of this combat system. The game is still Dark Resurrection at its core, but concepts that Tekken 6 brought in have been expanded or reconceptualized. In Tekken 6, they introduced Sabaki, hits with built-in parries to each character. Tekken's string combos, by their nature, are oppressive, and while some characters are designed to evade, the more straight-back characters need to really learn the ins and outs of the game to deal with them. Sabaki was a solution to this, but they themselves required stronger reads than an easy escape should have. It was better to just sidestep. In Tekken 7, many of these have been removed, and in their place, signature or useful moves have been given armor. Now, you still take the damage you would have, in many cases, but you can power through those hits. It's not a clean escape from the pressure, but at least you've gotten your revenge. Floor and wall breaks now include balcony breaks from Tag 2, which begins to re-emphasize the positioning and map knowledge that we were so sorely missing since Tekken 4's simulationist approach to map design. And now those drops result in much higher bound for you to work out a combo from. Bound, which left opponents a little low, has been replaced with a tailspin that, by its animation, has hitboxing that can be picked up even by higher hitting moves in the right circumstances. 
This looks great, this feels great, and it's generally increased the wall carry of juggles all around. Fights are more dynamic and momentum builds up. This is a double-edged sword. Juggle damage through the game's patches has reached insane heights. Sometimes over half your health as you reach a wall with a bread and butter combo. Tekken and Tag 2 had the same issue, and the predominant tactic became playing safe, low commitment, and play that's generally very boring to watch. You really don't want to get juggled. Fighting games are a spectator sport in the internet age, though. The remedy Tekken 7 has found is increasing the focus on hell sweeps and hatchets, among other classes of lows that are somewhat high commitment for moderate reward. The damage from these lows adds up. Sidestepping comes out of frame later now, I've been told. Escaping situations is more difficult. At higher levels of play, of course, you truly have to get into your opponent's mind, understand their character, and predict accurately. It's possible to do that, and you can find that headspace is rewarding and fun. But not to beginner or intermediate players, though. At least not in an online game with 50 characters and random player opponents. Most players don't play the same opponents frequently enough to learn their thought process. So if we combine this difficult to counteract mix-up gameplay with a juggle system that brings momentum into the winning player's corner, it's easy to start losing despite the rage system revamp. At low health, rage's increased damage scaling can now be forgone if you choose to cash it in on one of two options. Firstly, a rage drive move, which for most characters will launch or do something to help turn the tide back. Or a unique armor move which activates a cutscene with variable amounts of damage itself according to how close you are to death. I guess the player character just gets stronger the more they want revenge. These cutscenes are actually not the worst idea in the world. They open a window into the player character expressing themselves, separate from the player. Many older characters use old combos you could do in older games. Some are nostalgia grabs from cutscenes from older games or movies. They really break the pace though, since they are, after all, mid-game cutscenes that even freeze the timer. They're great if you're a beginner player, so you can regain your thoughts, but Miguel or Dragunov busting up Elise's optics is only interesting the first few times. Rage arts are actually what Nina's meant to be tutorializing here. Harada really is too good to me sometimes, isn't he? So just like that, Heihachi's taken over the Mishima Zaibatsu. Why didn't Kazuya do this earlier? Why isn't anyone else? Was it really this easy? Is Nina really just gonna let a sugar daddy's granddaddy waltz right on in her like that? And she's gonna work for him. Let me remind everyone that Heihachi harvested the eggs from her uterus while she was in a coma and used them to make children, most of which apparently died during experimentation. Nina brings this up in her own story mode. In order to get the plot moving, really, Heihachi decides to publicize that he's the head of the Mishima Zaibatsu again, and he's announcing the King of Iron Fist 7. Since the structure of this game's main story isn't restrained by the tournament setting at all, there's not really a point to this announcement. In Tekken 1, 2, and 3, Hei or Kaz wanted to vet strong fighters, the latter's case being someone who could kill Ogre. In 4, Heihachi was after Kazuya's Devil Gene in order to steal Ogre's power, a plot point that's going to be offensively swept under the rug as this game goes on. In Tekken 5, Jinpachi ordained the tournament in order to commit suicide by badass. In 6, it was part of Jin's plan to cause battle and strife across the world. Why on earth would you want to hold a tournament now, like this? He doesn't explain later. He's genuinely only doing this to piss Kazuya off, and he does that anyway by simply being alive. When we get to the additional character story modes, we'll find most of them didn't even care about Iron Fist, and those that do don't arrive or see through the tournament before running away for some daft reason or another. Until now, Iron Fist has been something somewhat sacred in the series, that brought out the finest fighters in the world. It was a calling to all the strongest to meet their fates in some way or another. Now the namesake of the series is an empty formality. I'd rather they hadn't bothered trying to force it in. This brings me to another absolutely forced part of this storytelling. Ripping off Ace Combat really, really badly. A primary fan complaint of the story mode is the journalist. The concern most people seem to have is that his voice acting seems shoddy, to which the voice actor himself, who doubles as the announcer for the game, has said his delivery was intentionally directed as it's spoken. Unfortunately, Ace Combat doesn't have as large an audience as it deserves. Not everyone notices that the drawn style, subdued murmuring and failed revenge narrative he follows are a failed homage. It entirely misses the point, so badly in fact I furiously hate this framing device. The journalist is an unplayable tragic character, his story is told with retrospect, and true to his career choice he cannot remain unbiased and continuously chooses to insert his emotions into situations verbally without expressing them in his reading. His first two cutscenes take the opportunity to express how happy and perfect his cherished family is, a wife and son whom he apparently deeply loves, enough to tell us he cried without any hint of emotion in his telling. I was so happy, I cried. 
Since he's a freelance war journalist, he was away on business when he received news that his son and wife were tragically killed, collateral in Jin's war efforts from the previous game. Unfortunately, his story stumbles at this first hurdle. Why wasn't he working from home? The depiction of his home burning has the streets lined with tanks, which tells us that the front line was close enough to his house that he could have been working there and possibly saved his family, or better yet, have perished with them and saved us from this god-awful storyline. During this retelling, his detached voice, yet bluntly emotional language, do not match at all. If you compare it to Ace Combat 4's narrator, that voice retells the most tragic parts of his life without directly inserting his pain into it. Instead, he poetically expresses his grief, and allows the moment to sit with lingering upset stills. One fleeing plane fell out of the skies, spiraling and spewing orange flames to crash by the cape. The same cape where my family lived. Now they only live in my memories of days past. This is called pacing. It's also called showing and not telling. Let's compare it to this clip. The place I once called home was now just an ashen field. And streets echoed with the memories of playing children and delivery trucks. Everyone I loved had been lost to the past. That day, my old life ended, and a new one began. In my loneliness and despair, a hatred grew inside me. Every line Tekken 7's narrator says has three to four seconds of dead silence between it, without fail. There's not even sound effects to fill that consistent dead air. It attempts to steal the taste and valor of Ace Combat 4's cutscenes while simultaneously entirely missing the artistry necessary to deliver it. Ace Combat 4's narrator lost his family in a war and has a failed revenge narrative. His story is full of embarrassment and naivete. Tekken 7's journalist follows the exact same plot, but has no interpersonal relations with anyone around him, and it builds zero stakes. Ace Combat 4's narrator has a love interest, and he finds a family with the enemy whom he so devotedly hates. Tekken 7's journalist has nothing. He's a ghost. The story wouldn't have changed in any way had he not existed, and he doesn't even provide reasonable insight into the story that he's telling. I feel... I feel... physical contempt for the writing staff at Tekken Project for daring to steal Ace Combat 4's profound, beautiful mulling of war's horrors and heroism, and for butchering it so carelessly, just so they can fuck up Tekken Story 2 in the process. The journalist at least raises a valid question. He asks what evil is, and struggles to suggest there is no good side in the ongoing war. In order to do this, the story is going to have to focus on the image of the Zaibatsu and G-Corp to the public focusing directly on the Mishima feud itself and asking who's in the right. The journalist gets a lead that tells him about how G-Corp bombed the Mishima Dojo in Tekken 5's opening, giving us a reason to retread through it. The greatest fight scene Tekken ever had. If you needed an example of how the previous game's writing and directing was on a whole nother level than this one's, look no further than this chapter. The cutscenes are so beautifully detailed and rendered in comparison to 7, which itself has the cutscenes not look that too far off in-game assets. Characters have chemistry. Heihachi's indignation and Kazuya's impudence play well off each other. Kazuya gives it the good old DF2 and then the game awkwardly cuts to its in-game remix of the song. It's in comparison to 12-year-old assets that it really becomes apparent Tekken 7's character models just look off. Kazuya looks smoothed over, which doesn't really fit the sharper features he's had historically. I'll be generous and pretend this is because he had to have some resemblance to Kazumi as well, but now it makes Jin look nearly unrelated to his father other than by the family hairdo. On the other hand, Heihachi, who once had the ferocious appearance of an Oni, looks like Dr. Phil in this game. Quite the family counselor. The futile battle against a swarm of Jack Fours is a little bit butchered in its drama, when their bodies ragdoll like its demon souls. This does mark Jack Four's only in-game appearance, and it's a little embarrassing. Voskonovich done goofed. Really, I can't hate this scene because, God bless Sano DG, this song is so good. The minor key's rising progression really represents the struggle of progressing through this onslaught before the next flock of robots is here to take their turn. Fortunately, the game has a much better time transitioning into cutscenes than out of them. So we start to feel the pace again as Kazuya destroys the statue of the Buddha, which played a key symbolic role in the previous game. Wait, yeah, what about Tekken 4? This isn't where the corporate war started, it was Tekken 4 when Heihachi performed a raid on G-Corp to steal Kazuya's corpse. 
Admittedly, there's a reason beyond just nostalgia that we're going through this opening, but it makes the journalist look incompetent. He says this is where the corporate war started, and it's not, meaning he's both unrelatable and unreliable. This might be the most accurate depiction of a journalist I've seen in fiction, but it makes for a terrible protagonist. With no sign of the Jack stopping, Kazuya bowls a spare and takes the opportunity to slip out unnoticed. My next line will be, he leaves his father with the self-assurance that the old man is already dead. This also introduces an inconsistency of portrayal in this game. If Kazuya wanted revenge for his dead mother since Tekken 1, why is he only treating Heihachi's death as a convenient exit here? Although people seem to value my channel's videos because they think I'm big into the lore of Tekken or any game I cover, I actually only care about the lore as long as it's here to supply a message. I don't care that Brian collects cigarette lighters or that Lars hates Japanese food. If there's a retcon this game, it's okay. The older games still exist in their own intended continuity. If I wanted to, I could point out that one of the plot twists in Tekken 4 was that Kazuya was taking everything back, and that was actually a reference to how Devil had split between himself and Jin. He didn't want anything from Heihachi. This followed in Tekken 5. Heihachi's livelihood isn't of any concern, the old man was just an egg in Kazuya's world domination omelette. Without proper justification, it would be lazy to pick Tekken 7 apart for this in my opinion. But if he's going to revert their character dynamic back to Tekken 1, the least they could do was not show Kazuya's previous lack of dedication as to whether Heihachi lives or dies during this flashback. There's three reasons we flashed back to this event. Firstly, the journalist was asking, what is evil, by comparing the Zaibatsu and Jiko, which are puppets for Heihachi and Kazuya. He erroneously claims this is where the war started. We can give this a pass, I guess, because Tekken 7's heavily themed around the concepts of revenge, and this attack was revenge for Tekken 4's raid. Secondly, Tekken 5 and Dark Resurrection sales combined are the highest in the series, and this is an admittedly great realisation of what they were attempting to do with the game to cutscene transitions for Tekken 7. It's hard to give it full credit with the poor music mixing, however. Thirdly, the corporate war, which until this point had been a plot device to the themes of unrestrained power, has now become a primary plot point, even though the themes of power have been totally abandoned in this game's story. This callback's an attempt at making the journey through these games feel like some kind of pre-planned epic that was 20 years in the making, culminating in Tekken 7. But it's obviously struggling to do this by retroactively making the corporate war relevant to Heihachi and Kazuya's rivalry. Which is stupid because even this game admits that Heihachi was in hiding after this exact event for the past two games, which is the entirety of the corporate war, according to the journalist's perspective. After the credits of Tekken 6, Raven apparently stole Lars's truck, or Lily's truck, and drove it back out to the desert. The area is cordoned off by soldiers protecting what looks like a male figure in the sand. Raven laments this turn of events, and the camera looks to a recognisable tribal tattoo, a sign that Jin and his devil are still alive. They pick him up for transport, but naturally his UN helicopter ride is short-lived. The devil is intermittently taking control for Jin's self-preservation. He is uncapturable by force. Do you remember when the Mishima Zaibatsu took over the United Nations? By implying, and in Master Raven's playthrough, confirming Raven works for the United Nations, they've raised a number of questions about the organization's involvement in the story. Why would Raven help Lars if he's working for the UN, owned by Jin's Mishima Zaibatsu? Why is it that Nina or Heihachi Zaibatsu speak of the UN like they're their own entity, as if their movements are unrelated to his? Why would the United Nations be trying to curry a Jin off straightjacketed like a prisoner if he's their boss? All of these questions aren't very interesting, because they have nothing to do with this or that game's core themes. Which leads me to believe that this isn't an intentional retcon, but a mistake by the writing staff. Jin, having assumedly wandered for a while, ends up in a well-populated market town somewhere in Medik. Can't imagine a better place for the world's most wanted randomly exploding demon man to have staggered into. Lars cuts off the UN forces before a war crime can occur, so he can save Jin. What a turn of fate. And he does so by pointing his gun in some of the worst gunplay I've had the misfortune of touching, which is a shame. I'd come to somewhat enjoy Lars's ridiculous playstyle. You can still use your typical fighting set, but the enemy AI in the game is pretty circumvincible, even during the most intense narrative fights when they're not a 2D character at least. While we're tying up these loose ends, it's about this time that the journalist starts following Lee Chao Lan around. If you complete the final boss of Tekken 6 using Elisa, you get two extra data logs after the mission. The first is an internal report that Jin's final order, to her, is to do as she pleases after he's gone. Small redeeming moment for the monster. 
The second is almost postcard-esque, with Elisa facing the camera having been rebooted, optimistic about the future, deeply expressing a gratitude for Lars's kindness, which she shall never forget. In Tekken 7, she wakes up with amnesia, which I suppose is one of her defining character traits at this point. This is used to cause a needless fight between her and Lee first, and then both of them together against Heihachi's Tekken Force. But this is a retcon that the game doesn't take lightly, for once. She has a brief flashback to Tekken 6 and remarks that this guy's the weird CEO that she met, instantly earning some adoration. Other than him and Jin, though, her memories are vague. Her inability to specifically remember Lars might be the biggest emotional payoff in the game. It depends strongly on some of the only actually valuable writing Tekken 6 had, and the only positive relationship in the series save for Zhao Yu and Panda. She recalls how he tried to hold her hand as it fell limp and sheds genuine tears. Lee is moved by a display, and leads her to the mysterious man of her memories. Lars introduces himself by pointing a gun at his family member's head, which I suppose is one of his defining character traits at this point. It's apparently a mistake, I assume it's because like Heihachi, Lee also dresses like a pimp. <laughs> And there's the payoff. Finally, someone expresses some fucking emotion, some care, some, something to endear the viewer, something to show what's worth fighting for in this miserable fucking world. Lee was a ruthless CEO who happened to find himself on the better side of a net negative conflict in the last game. But since Tekken Tag 2, he's become a sociopath who exclaims excellent when he sees something he approves of. Which happens to be everything, apparently. Now's no time for Lars to play Fridge Magnet anyway. He has possession of Jin and delivered him to Violet Industries for safekeeping. We almost get an actual explanation for why Lars has done this, but the Tekken Force headed by Nina kicks the door in. We never get an answer for what Lars is doing, other than that Jin is the only person who can save the world, which he doesn't qualify with any reason or method. We see a bit of bad gunplay, Lars tells Elise to make sure Jin's safe, and Nina appears for no reason other than to annoy me. Oh, I see. Now Nina gets a key charge with a hitbox, and she spams those annoying strings, and even if you win, she rage arts you. <laughs> Nina hooks Jin up to a helicopter, somehow, indoors, for some reason. I don't know why Heihachi wants the boy, or Nina, or anyone, really. Jin's entire storyline to be here is to throw him on a bus so that Kazi and Heihachi can have space to settle their dispute that they suddenly have. There are enough loose plot threads left by Tekken 6, they were clearly obligated to pick them up. <laughs> Fuck yes! That weak grenade shit out the window don't fucking work on anyone. Eat shit, you bog trotter. Get rocket punched, get chainsawed. Oh no, she's stealing Jin away. But it's Lee in the helicopter. Damn, Nina, nice plan. You had a chance to be a character, but nah, you gave it up to be a Mishima bitch. You wanna know how you explode someone? You don't give them a chance to jump out. You lock them in a fucking cell, and you nuke the entire floor. Rest in potato! <laughs>